Well, good morning, church. It's our joy to be able to worship together on this Resurrection Sunday. We gather in this place because we know that our Redeemer is alive. And our hope is found uh, here in Scripture in John chapter 20. Would you stand as I read John chapter 20? We'll use this as our call to worship this morning, and then we'll sing together. John 20 says, Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. Would you sing with the choir and orchestra?
It's not in my notes, but would everybody stand up and greet one another? There's so many fun people here today. Let's take a moment and greet one another, and we'll get back to the service.
Well, as we uh, gather back into our seats and uh, we get to celebrate a little bit more what Jesus has done, uh, one thing uh, I wanted to share with you, one thing I love is a good surprise. And last Sunday, uh, it was towards the end, it was about church is over 12 o'clock. It was about 1240 or so, and there were only a few people left. And Lauren Miller is our children's director, and she was walking here with her four kids. And she said, I got a great story to tell you. So I said, okay, tell me, Lauren. Uh, she said in children's church just last week, they were talking about Jesus uh, suffering, death, burial. And then when they got to the resurrection, one little girl said, you mean he's alive? And she was thrilled and surprised. And I know that most of us have already read the rest of the story and we know that he is alive. But be surprised again today that Jesus actually is alive. And uh, through the lobby, I got to meet a lot of people who said, Christ is risen. And I've been in the church world long enough to know you're supposed to say, he's risen indeed. And you might be really good at that. But is he risen in your heart? Do you have a relationship with him? So this Easter, I just want to pray for those of us here that maybe would say, I got all the head knowledge, Wayne. I know it's not about the Easter Bunny. I know he rose from the dead. But if truth were known, I'm not ready to meet him if he returns like the song we just said. He's coming back someday. Maybe this afternoon. Or I'm going to die. Maybe this afternoon. Are you ready to meet him? Let's pray. Lord, I just pray for uh, that person that's here today that says, you know, if truth were known, I'm not ready to meet Jesus. I pray, Lord, that today they'd meet you because you're alive. We're not worshiping statues. We're not lighting any candles. uh, We're not sacrificing anything. Jesus, you uh, provided the ultimate sacrifice 2,000 years ago. You are truly the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And you are truly the Lamb of God who took away Wayne Bielgaard's sin. And I'm so thankful for that. I thank you, Lord, that you canceled hell and have guaranteed me heaven. And I want that for more people. And I pray even today, Lord, as we sing to you, as Spence gets up and preaches, as uh, Ken reads a passage of scripture where Mary was surprised that you were alive, I pray, Lord, that you would surprise someone today and show them that you're actually real and that you are alive. And you're not just a historical figure, but you are who you claim to be, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So I love you today. Thank you for meeting me uh, almost 29 years ago. And I pray, Lord, you'd meet some more people today and they'd be able to say this was the greatest Easter of their life. I pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen.
Continuing in the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 11 through 18. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. And having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni which means teacher. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her.
Church. Please be seated.
Amen. Every Easter, we want to give you the opportunity to hear uh, from somebody whose life has been transformed uh, by this risen Savior that the choir just sang about. And uh, this year, uh, we have the privilege of hearing from Diego Torres. Now, uh, Diego used to uh, come to church here. He still comes uh, to the youth group on Wednesday nights. But a few years ago, um, we sent his dad and his mom and his his entire family uh, down to plant a church, a Spanish-speaking church down uh, in Gurney, Illinois. And so uh, that's Esperanza Viva. You, you probably remember Jose Torres. This is his son on the screen. And uh, I know you're in for a treat to hear from what the Lord's done in Diego's life. Hello, my name is Diego Torres and I'm a high school senior and this is my testimony. I grew up in the church my whole life. I would go to church and hear, but I would never listen. I heard the gospel a million times, but I always ignored it. All I wanted to do with my entire life was give it up in the pursuit of money. And I thought that the chase of money would satisfy me and would fulfill me. My sin consumed me, and it was what I lived for. Sin was the Lord of my life. I thought that I was saved because I had prayed a prayer one time and believed that that was what saved me. But I had no desire to go to church and no desire to learn anything about God. I wanted everything to do with money and what I wanted. Everything in my life was about my benefit, my wants, my needs. I was angry, I was sad, I was upset because no matter what I did, I was never truly happy. I felt unfulfilled and empty, but then God, being rich in mercy and grace, saved me from a life full of empty promises and the road to hell. He gave me a new purpose and a new life, which is only found in His Son, Jesus Christ. He is now my joy. One night, I was sitting on my bed and thought, Diego, if you really call yourself a Christian, what are you doing? After this, a new desire arose in me. I wanted to read the Bible and listen to sermons because I wanted to know Christ. I realized that I called myself a Christian, but I was living in the world. I was living for my own desires. I was living for what I wanted to do with my life. I was not living for Christ. I wanted it all to be about me. So on one night, Monday, November 27, 2023, I listened to Paul Washer say, you can have all the money and fame in this world, but if you don't have Christ, then you have nothing. That night, I was so convicted of the life that I was living far away from God. I was convicted that my whole life had revolved around me and not Him. I said I belonged to Him, but I didn't. And that night, I repented of my sin and gave my entire life to Christ. That night, I was given a new purpose, a new heart. I was given a hope. I was given a new desire. I was given a new life graciously by the love of God. He gave it to me overnight miraculously. He changed my heart and my desires. I knew that before I could have never wanted the things I do now. And I knew that before I could have never done what I did that night or thought the things that I thought that night. I could have never done it with my own will. It was him who saved me completely, not me. All his grace and his mercy and his great love was for me. I now want to work in the church no matter what it may be because there is no greater thing than to give up my life for the one who gave up his life for me first who loved me first and changed my heart. Before I was dead in my sin and now I am alive in Christ. I was blind, but now I see. I was lost and now I am found. I was in darkness, now I am in light. All of this was by the grace of God. I was angry, now I'm happy. I was without hope and now I'm hopeful. I was in despair and now I'm joyful in Christ. All of this is by His miraculous grace and mercy. Now Christ is my Lord. I will never be perfect and my Christian life will never be without flaw. I will always struggle with it because I am so weak, but He is so strong and great, all the more greater than I will ever be. He will hold me fast. He saved me by doing this. God knew that I would never be able to fulfill His law perfectly, 
and in his love sent his son Jesus Christ to live a perfect life that I could have never lived. He was beaten, mocked, and killed for my sins and died on the cross for me and rose up again after three days in victory over sin and death and now reigns with God forever and ever and he is alive. All glory and praise be to him who loved me first. He didn't just do this for me, he did this for you too. All it takes is faith and belief in what Jesus Christ did for you, which is what I just described. Repent and believe the gospel and follow Christ full-heartedly because he is worth more than anything. He is to be desired more than gold. God is here in this room today and so are his angels rejoicing with us and praising him. So I now encourage you to love him and to put him above everything else in your life because he is worth more than anything you could ever possibly desire. Amen. Would you stand as we sing together of the gospel? <coughs> on which I stand for all eternity. It is my story, my Father's plan, the Son has rescued me. Oh, what a gospel, oh, what a peace, my highest joy and my deepest need. Now and forever He is my light, I stand.
What a joy to sing together, to praise the risen Savior who gave his life for us. How great it was to hear that testimony from our beloved brother Diego and how wonderful to be led in worship by the choir and the orchestra. We, we know you guys uh, came early and stayed late to practice for weeks leading up to this and we appreciate you. But more than that, um, we love you because we're family in the Lord Jesus Christ and we belong to each other because of his blood because of his resurrection. It's my, uh, it's my great joy to preach the gospel this morning, the gospel of salvation through Jesus Christ, just like Diego shared that the Lord saved him. And the gospel, as it's presented in John, we're gonna read from John chapter 20, the gospel as it's presented in John is this, the gospel of life in Jesus' name. That's what he keeps saying, and that's what he culminates in in 2031. The gospel, as it's presented in John, is the gospel of life in Jesus' name, which means the gospel is what happens when you move from death to life, from unforgiven to forgiven, from hopeless to filled with hope, but it also means that that move is made in his name. And if Jesus is the name above all names, then the life we receive in Jesus is also the life above all other life. So Brennan read from the beginning of chapter 20 to open our service. My brother Ken read from the middle of it, and I'm gonna read from verse 19 down to the end. But before I do, uh, we're gonna pray because this is all for nothing. If the living God doesn't empower his servants and his people and his word, so let's pray. Lord God, if you work in us now by your mighty power, then surely your work shall be completed. Living God, if you save us, then we shall be saved. But if this hour is merely the voices and the words and the thoughts of men and women, then it's powerless. And so we pray with confidence in your spirit that the spirit of God inspired the word, that the spirit of God now illumines the word and uses the word to convert, to convict, and to conform us even to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. John chapter 20, verse 19. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed him his hands and his side, and the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the 12 called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, Unless I place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This wonderful text about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the the human sort of interest in it, beyond, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ, is this fellow that we, we in the church call Doubting Thomas. We've always called him Doubting Thomas. I'm not sure why, it's just what we've always done. But I have come to the conclusion this year that we, there's no way we can call him that anymore. We need to just call this guy Thomas. Because he was doubting Thomas, but by the end, like, he was no longer 
Doubting Thomas. And the reason that I think it really stinks that we call him Doubting Thomas is this. Would you want me to always refer to like the worst thing you ever did in your life whenever I say your name? Well, of course not. And I wouldn't want that from you. It's no surprise to you that I have done some dumb things in my life. I've been pastor at this church long enough that many of you have been privileged to see those and experience those things with me. And I I wouldn't want that to be freeze-framed like that's the only thing you remember about me. In fact, I thought about introducing this sermon with like a top five list of my most embarrassing moments in my life. And of course, you would appreciate that. The choir would go nuts for that, but I'm not going to do that. (laughs) Instead, I'm just going to say that we both know the feeling that we don't want to be remembered for the worst thing that we ever did. And that's why I think it kind of stinks that we call this guy Doubting Thomas, because though it's true that Doubting Thomas is who he was, that's no longer who he is. And the reason why is the reason we're preaching and singing today. It's the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so as you look with me at John chapter 20, specifically the last third of it, you'll see how everything changes because of the resurrection of Jesus. The first change in verse 19, the first change in verse 19 is because Jesus is risen, you can change from scared and uncertain to bold and confident. From scared and uncertain to bold and confident. You see there in verse 19, it says that the disciples were afraid and it says that the doors were locked. Why? Because their leader was taken away by armed guards and they're just waiting for the time when there's going to be a knock at the door or even even a battering ram at the door and those same armed guards who took their leader are going to come and take them. But what happens is Jesus appears and he says the word peace essentially is Jesus saying, no longer be afraid. I'm with you and I'm giving you power and I'm giving you peace. The disciples could change from being scared and uncertain to being bold and confident. After all, wouldn't it stink if every time we referred to the disciples, we called them the cowering, silent disciples who hide behind locked doors? Well, that's true. That's what they were, but that's no longer who they are. In fact, we know that every single one of them gave their blood so that more people could understand and receive the love that is only received through the blood of Jesus Christ. They changed from scared and uncertain to bold and confident. And I want to tell you, church family, this week, some of you have been intimidated and scared to invite someone to church or to share a Bible verse with them, or to ask if you could pray for them. And through the resurrection of Jesus, you too can move from intimidated and silent to compassionate, courageous, and bold. But there's a second change, and that is you can move from guilty to forgiven. You see it in verse 22. He he says, receive the Holy Spirit. And then he says, if you forgive anyone, they're forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness, it's withheld from them. You can move from guilty and enslaved to free and forgiven. I suppose this requires a little bit of explanation. I don't mean that this is the exact moment when their sins were forgiven. We celebrated that on Good Friday. If you were here, we read from John 19 and we said that when Jesus said, it is finished, that was actually the moment when sin was forgiven. But I think you would agree with me as you see this narrative in John 20, at least it's the case that experientially, the disciples moved in this moment in John 20 from not understanding what that meant to understanding what that meant. And everyone here can move from guilty and enslaved to sin to forgiven and free if you will understand and believe this good news of the gospel. My brother Diego explained the gospel in his testimony. The gospel is so simple that it's been summarized in four words. Jesus in my place. The sinless one dying on the cross that those who believe in him would have their sins forgiven. And I suppose a little explanation is necessary for the way that Jesus says this. I don't interpret this to mean that Jesus sort of on purpose, that Jesus on purpose like sets apart a different class of people like priests who can do what only God can do and forgive sin. Only God can forgive sin. All Jesus means is that all of his disciples 
because of his death and because of his resurrection, all of his disciples who have believed and understood the gospel can now share that gospel with others. And the way that Jesus puts it is this, that gospel is so true. Jesus' resurrection body is so alive and his resurrected heart is so beating that you can actually tell anyone and everyone, if you trust in Jesus, I promise you, in the name of the risen Jesus, your sins really are forgiven. And he adds the downside of it too, that Jesus is so alive and so coming back to judge that you can and perhaps you need to tell everyone who has not believed. Brother, sister, you know, friend, I love you, but your sins are unforgiven and you will die in your sin unless you believe. This is a part of our gospel and we proclaim it with compassion and with love. Well, we see that not only does, uh, not only does the resurrection move us from, from scared to courageous and not only from guilty to forgiven, but there's a third change, and this is the big one. We move from doubting to believing. Just like Thomas, who used to be doubting Thomas, but is no longer doubting Thomas, you can move from unbelieving to believing. I guess we'd have to admit that all of us have doubted God. All of us have doubted Jesus from time to time. I was wondering about doubt. Actually, just yesterday, I was standing, in, standing looking out my window into my backyard, and I saw two fat squirrels. And I saw several robins, and I was lucky enough to see a pair of cardinals. I always see them in a pair, that, that fire engine red male and that beautiful pale, you know, peach female. And I was watching those birds and watching those squirrels, and then... We have a dog, an Irish wolfhound, and he came up to nuzzle me so that I would, you know, scratch his ear. Some of you have a dog that when you scratch their ear, like, you have to throw your back out and go down, you know, for your chihuahua. For me, his ears are like, he's like here. And hard. So I was scratching Chester's ears, and I just thought, those fat squirrels, they've never doubted God. Those robins... They've never doubted their maker. This dog, he doesn't doubt God. And then I wondered, I can't see angels, but I wondered, I wonder if angels even doubt God. Now, the Bible says that angels disobeyed. But if you're familiar with it in James chapter one, it says that even every angel who disobeyed, they know that God is and that God is one. And I wondered if it's the case that only Men and women created in the image of God are the ones who doubt God. And if that is the case, then I think that's almost the saddest thing that could be said about us. Remember I say you wouldn't want to be remembered for like the worst thing you ever did. I, whatever the worst thing you did is, maybe it was a crime. Maybe you ruined a family. Like I, the, these things are, these, these things are, 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 are so difficult. But I wonder if the worst thing anyone can ever do is look at Jesus and say, you're not good enough for me. You're not strong enough for me. You're not loving enough for me. Because he's Jesus, his blood really can wash away all the worst things that we have done, but we have to believe. We have to receive this gospel. And Thomas definitely moved from doubting to believing. And you see it, don't you, in verse 28. He says, my Lord and my God. This is the greatest confession that any human being can ever make. This is the greatest change in thinking and direction that can ever happen in your life, is to move from thinking, I'm the Lord of my life. I do whatever I feel like doing to saying Jesus, because of his life and death for me, is the Lord of my life. And now my greatest desire and my greatest joy is to follow him. He calls Jesus my Lord and my God. As divine, Jesus is worthy of all worship and all obedience. And because Jesus is the Savior, he's also worthy of loyal love. You can move from unbelieving to believing, just like Thomas did. And I want you to see that in, in uh, verses 29 and 30 and 31, 
If you count verse 27, there's the, the word believe shows up like four or five times in that tiny little package of verses. Why is that? Because the point of it all is that you would believe. So one more question. What does it mean to believe? I can explain that by a, a little story, and it's a true story. And it's a story from the life of a missionary who Amy and I have long admired. His name was John Patton, and he served the Lord in the New Hebrides years ago. And he went there to a tribe that had never heard of Jesus and didn't have a Bible, and he went there to translate the Bible and to share the good news of Jesus with them. And, and he was translating the Gospel of John. It was the first thing he translated. And the most important phrase in the Gospel of John in the Greek language is pestuo ace, or en, which means believe in, believe in Jesus. John says in 2031 in our text, that's the point of his whole Gospel, that you would believe in Jesus and have life in his name. And John Patton didn't know how to translate that word believe. And the reason it was hard for him is because, believe it or not, the tribe that he had gone to, they were cannibals at that time in their history. And um, none of them trusted any of the others of them. And actually, the way he described it, they like used deception as their default communication. And he, John Patton had found a word for like that person's telling me the truth. But he had so, such a hard time finding a word for believe or trust. And so his, a native speaker came in where he was translating the Bible in his little office and then this native speaker came in and John Patton was sitting in his chair. He says, what am I doing? And this native speaker used the verb, you're sitting in your chair. And then he did something clever. He leaned back in his chair and he like barely touched the desk like with his foot. So he's just like leaning all the way back in his chair. And he says to his, to his native speaking friend, now what am I doing? And he used a different verb. He, he used the verb for you are placing the whole weight of yourself upon something. And you know that's the verb that he used to describe exactly what John says is the purpose of the whole book, which is that by believing you may have life in his name. That's what it means to believe, to place the whole weight of your life on him. Did you notice the way that it closes? Verse 29, Jesus talks about you. Did you see that? Verse 29, Jesus talks about you. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. But it, it goes even more extreme than that because in verse 29, Jesus talks about you. In verses 30 and 31, John actually talks to you. He breaks the fourth wall and he speaks directly to you as his reader. And he says, there's a lot of things I could have written and a lot of reasons that I could have written him, but I've written these things so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. So let's no longer call him Doubting Thomas. That's what he was, but that's not what he is. And I want to speak one word to the church family about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, those who are believers in Jesus. And the one word that I want to tell you is this. No longer name yourself by the condemnation of your sin. Stop thinking and speaking and believing of yourself as who you were. That's not who you were. That's, that is who you were, but it's not who you are. In other words, if Jesus died in your place, this is a challenge to you, church family, it is derogatory, dismissive, and demeaning to Jesus for you to look at your sins that he took away as if they are still yours. Did his blood bury them or not? Did he die on the cross for them or not? Did he obliterate them in Hades in the grave and then rise again because the price had been paid or not? Now, church, I know you still sin. I know I still sin, and the choir sins like a ton. We all still sin. I understand that. And when we sin, like we feel guilty, we feel bad, we repent and confess, and we should. But does or does not, the Bible say that because of the blood of Jesus, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Is that true or not? 
Well, stop calling yourself by what you were. Those sins were washed in the blood. And the one thing I want to give the church family is the full-throated, full-hearted assurance that Jesus Christ has washed away your sin by his resurrection. And if I could speak very candidly, the one thing I must not do is give to anyone here who has not believed in Jesus that same assurance because it is not yours. It can be, but you must believe and you must make that confession, Jesus Christ, my Lord and my God. Be no longer disbelieving, but believe. Have life in his name. Let's pray. Living God, you and you alone can make the word powerful unto conviction and conversion. So bring life in your name through the gospel preached and received in hearts that are brought to life by your Holy Spirit. Amen.
Amen. Would you stand and sing with us? We're going to close by singing, I know that my Redeemer lives. Church, our Redeemer lives on heaven's throne, and in my very soul, our Redeemer lives. And because Jesus lives, 
I speak this word of benediction to you in his name. Church, I have delivered to you that which I have also received, which is of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And because Christ has accomplished this, God the Father has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen and amen.